but you know, verbally here, um, I didn't hear anything back yet. So I'm just going to kind of sit back and wait to see what pops up. Matt, I'm going to challenge you to pull something out of them. Yeah. So Francesca, are you there? I feel like we were talking about before you, you had, uh, you were talking about um, an open house this weekend. And I was, I was thinking you could maybe, you know. So yeah. the, the challenge was, is actually, I was on hold with uh, Ringwood Township. So I'm sorry, it was like half paying attention. Um, the challenge that I just had was I just met a inspector at one of my listings and I represent both sides. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I represent both sides and um, the chimney inspector was there and he gave the buyers a quote for like a little shy of $7,000 to make the chimney compliant and um, compliant period. Now I go to meet the roofing guy for an estimate and the seller lives right next door to the property and the seller walks over and gives me a quote because they had their chimney cleaned in August and gives me a quote for the chimney to get repaired and the quote is for $23.50. So I called the attorney to say, I'm sending over this invoice and it's gonna tell you same, and by the way, the trick is it's the same vendor. <laughs> that's that's the trick of it right so it's the same vendor I'm not sure if it's the same person but it's the same vendor so um, I called the attorney who's my recommended attorney to my buyer and said I just want to give you a heads up I said I'm gonna send out this quote I'm a little uncomfortable with the situation I said you know I premised it to my buyers and my sellers that sometimes what happens is the person who inspects and then is going to do the work, I don't always 100% trust. And please have that in the back of your head and let's get another quote. And then the seller gives me this bill, this invoice that says to make it whatever, this is what it's gonna cost you. And then the attorney says to me, hold up, I have one better. Supposedly the seller said, give me a bill, but don't make it everything that I need. Hmm. I mean, that to me is like so unethical in so many different levels, I think. I don't know. How do you overcome that? Yeah. Um, so anytime that we are in uh, a dual agency position, we have to we have to be a neutral party. And that is so hard sometimes. Yes, um, I know. The, the uh, you know, there's a lot of people on my team who will tell you that, I'm all over them sometimes because they, they do too much, right? Like as an agent and, and being a good agent, you want to be proactive and hitting things head on and trying to, to figure this out. Um, but in some cases it can backfire if we go too deep into an area that we can just punt it to the attorney. So for something like this, it's pretty clear that the, um, you know, the seller maybe asked for some things to be left off of that invoice, right? Um, and then the buyer got a, got a regular invoice, either that or another inspector came and, you know, with the buyer, you know, figured he'd fluff it up a little bit or put some other things down. I'm not sure, but I'm also, I'm, when you're representing both sides, you, in my opinion, have to completely disengage from this particular instance. This is one of the few times it's a blessing that we have attorneys in this part of New Jersey. Um, if you're not, you're dealing with a title company in Central Jersey and South Jersey, that can be even more complicated because now you have no choice but to get in the middle of it. Um, but here, um, my, my advice to you would be to punt it to the attorneys, right? Let them handle that. That's what, you know, that's what they're there for from a representation standpoint right now. And, um, you know, we want to get in the middle and facilitate it to help things go smoother. Um, you you want to make sure that the right thing is done. But the minute that you go in either side and disclose something that might be harmful to the other side, you know, it can, it can be a problem because of dual agency. So um, that would be my suggestion. I, I say, I tell this to the team 
all the time. Um, and I just said it a couple of minutes ago, just leave it to the attorneys. Don't do you put your head in too deep? You put your head in too deep. You put your head in too deep. And when you put your head in somewhere that it doesn't have to be, not that it shouldn't be, but that it doesn't have to be. Sometimes when stuff goes wrong, then all the fingers are pointed at the agent, right? When the agent really was just trying to do the right thing and, and, and help out by, by being involved more. But I'm the king with my clients of, hey, you know what? I'd love to, I'd love to jump in that, but that's really an attorney matter. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to do anything or step over any boundaries that could complicate some of the conversations between the attorneys. And in this case, that's what I would do. I would say, look, once it goes, our jobs put together a transaction. If we have to, we get involved to try to keep it together. But when it comes down to inspections, that's really, you know, an attorney. Um, world thing. So I know that we have two competing estimates. Ironically, they're from the same, you know, company. So I'm going to allow, you know, the attorneys to have that conversation and figure out the best way that makes everyone, you know, comfortable moving forward. That's what I would do. I would just get it off my shoulder and make sure you don't end up in the, in the middle of that. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? How they would handle a situation like that? <clears throat> So any, any, any like mastermind like this, I try to, I try to think of um, a way to just make it applicable to a whole bunch of things, not a particular scenario. So yeah, I'll just, just kind of extrapolate, I guess, that, that response a little bit and, and just drive home the fact that this is really applicable to so many different areas. Um, you know, I recently had an agent who uh, the attorney ended up allowing some language into the attorney review letter. It's an agent on our team. The, the other attorney put some language in the attorney review letter that said that the seller could get out before a certain date if things didn't, uh, if, the, if they couldn't find a place, which the buyer was completely unaware of. Um, the buyer sold their house, so they had to go somewhere. They have a baby and um, it started to get a little, a little difficult here with lining up closing dates and stuff like that. So the agent jumped in head first and was talking to the other agent, trying to figure out a way to nail down that final closing date, really, you know, doing what, if you were a buyer, let's be honest, you would want your agent to do. Um, the problem was that was a contractual uh, agreement and that was an attorney thing. So what ended up happening was, they got they got way down this this rabbit hole of trying to figure out when to close the sellers end up sending a letter to the attorney that basically said we're killing the whole deal and the buyers are like you can't do that and guess who they blamed the agent because the agent had taken ownership and responsibility for for that part of the transaction that really didn't need to be and, uh, you know, again, it's commendable. It's how most, most buyers would love their agent to be involved and, you know, figure this thing out and make it smooth. But when we have the ability to put, especially the minute anything gets difficult in my world where I feel like I could be at the center, I will give it back to the attorneys, let the attorneys deal with it. And then if I have to, we have, we can play the role of the hero, right? If things are not going right, we can come in and try to save it. But to put yourself in a position where somebody, you know, you just never know. Somebody hears the wrong thing and they're like, oh, well, the agent never told me that. And next thing you're, you're in the middle uh, when it really could have been an attorney to attorney transaction or um, conversation the whole time. So that's my advice there. Good. Anybody else? So yeah. Jane, are you, uh, are you able to talk on here? I see Jane on, uh, on mute. If you are just, uh, uh, I'm muted. yeah, I'm just messing with my camera while I'm listening to you. Cause I have a new camera and it's not working the way I want it to work. So, okay. Yeah. I agree with everything you're saying. And it, the reason why we so badly want to help is because of our natures. So why we're real estate agents is because we want to help people, but so it's hard to step back. And I think in this situation to compound it, I think that chimney guys, there's really no regulation on chimney guys. Um, they don't really have a license as a chimney person. So we often see quotes that are all over the place. The fact that it's the same 
company and it's a dual agency, you definitely have to step back. Definitely. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Jane, uh, for about seven years, whenever I had one of these questions, that's the person I called. <laughs> was Jane. So it is pretty convenient to have her on these now. Um, half of what I say, probably more than half, came from her at some point anyway. He um, actually called me a number of times when I was still a Cobalt Banker and he was at KW. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like I, if I if I want opinions from uh, from credible reliable sources, Jane is at the top of that list. So I have a I have a list of of people that I reach out to when I have a challenge. So we're blessed to um, you know to have Jane as part of our circle now too. And uh, you know Jane can uh, can certainly speak to these kind of issues in a you know in a in a very well versed and I mean she's handled thousands of broker level issues in her years managing you know hundreds and hundreds of agents so yep. um that's that's great to have so jane if i ever give the wrong advice uh by talking too so much yeah t tell everyone because i not, would tell you <laughs> okay sounds good um francesca any any other thoughts on that or All right, we'll chalk that one. I'm I'm completely the worst. I'm sorry. I'm one of those multitasker Zoom callers. That's so. So okay. um, I 100% agree, and I tend to go in and try to fix the problem, and that's a that's a good thing. But I get it in this situation; it has to be something that I have to scale it back and kind of let the attorneys do. So I did talk to the attorney. He is going to take the lead on it, and I'm just going to back myself out. Awesome. So thank you. But it's insane that it's, you know, the same company to me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it is. It really is. Um, there's, you know, the, I, we all have our opinions about these, these chimney companies. It's, uh, Can I ask a question? Have you used this chimney company before, Francesca? Um, I think we have in the past. I don't have a relationship with them per se. Yeah. I, I use a different company. Um, but I know they're peripheral and they're pretty prominent in the area. Okay. Um, so it's not like a fly by night company. That was my question. If it's just some yeah. random person. No, so. no, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else we got? Maria, you said you've been running around like crazy. Any challenges on your end that you're facing that we can uh, maybe talk through, talk around? Mine just happened to be managing life life issues and personal laundry and cooking and oh uh, you're talking my, the wrong my person business <laughs> and my dad's medical appointments and you know just all of that so megan are, are you able to uh to talk here i know you're on mute yeah yes yeah. so this might this might be uh a really nice conversation i think for for everybody um i think megan it's safe to say that uh, you, you have some things changing in your world, which, you know, are, are causing you to have to adapt, right? The amount of time that you work and focus and energy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I got six weeks <laughs> before this baby's here. So, <laughs> and you're also renovating a house, right? Um, two. Yes. And okay. helping my parents renovate a third. So yeah. 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 So, um, do you have any, you're also like, um, from 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 my time working with you, a very structured person. Like you like to have some structure. So where a lot of people would just go into those projects, guns blazing. Um, I, I imagine you've you've kind of thought that through. Any any thoughts that you can share from Maria? And again, keep in mind when we when we mastermind these, and you're really good at this, we try to 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 create um, kind of just macro ideas that people could apply to everything, right? So that everybody on this call and somewhere or another, like, all right, we're juggling a bunch of stuff. Maybe I can use some of that approach to help me in, in my world right now. Yeah, um, leverage is my biggest thing. Um, asking for help. It's like the hardest thing because I'm like, I'm independent, I can do it myself. Like I can be eight months pregnant running around. Like, yes, I can, but is that the best use of my time? Um, and so I... I definitely leverage out and I don't necessarily mean like, like I, you know, oh, we have showing a partner showing that like, that's not necessarily what I mean. I mean, like if laundry is like not something that is like going to be a good use of my time, then I will send it out <laughs> because 
it's probably worth that 30 cents a pound to just send it out just that one time. Like, and so I'm very good about figuring out what those things are within a budget because I'm also the budget Nazi in my house. Sorry, <laughs> uh, sorry Kurt. Um, but that's one of my biggest things is like just figuring out like I make a list and then I figure out which one of those things do I need to be doing and then which ones can I actually give to somebody else. Um, and some things you just can't. I mean, especially if you're dealing with like you know, parents, medical things like that is really tough. Um, so some things are, are, you can't drop. So it's like the, the rubber ball, glass ball kind of conversation. So which one is a rubber ball that you can, you can drop, it'll bounce back. And which one's the glass ball that you can't drop because it will shatter. Um, so I try and figure out which one of those things uh, each item is on my list. And then I go through the list and I just set aside time and I literally set a timer. Like I'm one of those crazies that literally sets a timer. So like if I know, all right, I've got to schedule these showings. I give myself 15 minutes. I have to do them in that 15 minutes and that's it. And then I go to the next thing. So that's kind of how I structure it. Um, and then I also like know my day, my whole day is structured. Um, I have a little bit of like wiggle room because I, you need that. You can't just have every hour, every minute, like completely filled with something like you do need that flex time so I have like really like my three to four right now is kind of flex time so I'm sort of doing social media I'm sort of like I'm kind of doing a little bit of everything um but I checked off everything and you have book I really love my book <laughs> so you have to figure out what works for you some people like google calendar is like their jam and you know you can put everything in google calendar I tend to like glaze over it if it's in my phone I'll just not do it. But when I write it down, I actually draw a checkbox next to it. And then I cross it off or put your check or whatever you do. Um, and it works. I mean, I've got post-it notes everywhere too. Like <laughs> We just have stuff like that everywhere. Um, Cause that for me, that like crossing it off is really the like joy. I don't know. I hope that helps. Is that like... <laughs> No, that, I, that is awesome. So there's really, um, there's two things that, well, Megan said a lot of things there, but there's two things that I think we can all use and apply. Um, the first one is the, the list, right? Um, and it's not always a to-do list. Uh, you know, some productivity coaches will say the to-do list is painful, right? But I'd imagine, although she didn't get into it, I'd imagine her list, well, she did get into it because she said she knows what her glass balls are and she knows what her rubber ones are, right? So what that means is that when she puts a list together, the things she's got to do, she ranks them in some way, shape or form so that the more important things get done. Um, she also has a visual um, uh, representation of accomplishment, right? Of, of moving along on any given day. Um, I work the exact same way with my list and I start at the top and I put a little circle, mine's less checkboxy, but actually every Tuesday I call all my um, under contracts. I touch base with all of them. Every Thursday I call all my sellers. So I have in the back of my book, which is upstairs right now, I'm at home, but I have my little red book. You guys see me without my red book, I'm lost. I always have that red book with me. At the end of the book, I have all of my active under contracts and all of my active listings. What I do on every um, Thursday is I draw the whole set of little boxes. And as the day goes on, I you know scribble each one out and I can feel that momentum going so that by the end of the day, I, I touched everyone. But then when there's only three or four left, I'm like, I want to get to that finish line instead of it still feeling like this you know, huge mountain of things to do. And I think the same thing goes for your daily tasks. If you have a visual representation, if you are a visual um, person or somebody that really likes that, check it off, clear it, to have that visual is really important as opposed to somebody who's depending just on digital. And no matter what you do, you don't feel like you got anything done and you feel like you still got the world ahead of you that day to do it. Um, so that was, that was the one thing. And then the second thing she told us she does is a brain dump, right? Used other words, but everything gets out onto that paper. And if she's anything like me, as the day goes on, if something pops up, it makes its way onto that list, right? And then we'll, you know, rank it and how it goes there. 
Um, but Sean Annan, I don't think he's on here, but he talks about it all the time, how he does um, just a brain dump every once in a while. He just sits there and gets everything out of his head and on a piece of paper. So if you have all the things you need to do laid out in front of you, and then you categorize them, um, that puts you in a much better position to operate at ease with a plan and organize and find out what things you can delegate, what things you can drop that are going to bounce back and to identify those major ones, um, that, you know, that you can't. Well, and Bill, I just, I just want to show this is a, I actually bought this at, um, I think it was family reunion last year. It's a one thing mouse pad where it literally, you can write down a list. I did this on Friday because I was like getting, I had all these like little tasks and I was writing them down and then you can itemize them by what you should do versus what you could do. You know, things that absolutely needed to get done before I left the day on Friday versus things I could wait till Monday. Um, and that's how I always like to look, look at things too. It's just what should I do or what do I need to do versus what can I do? But if I don't do it, it can, it can wait till Monday because I think for all of, all of us, our days are, are seemingly endless. Um, there's not enough hours in the day. So I think we have to prioritize, okay, what needs to get done today and what can get pushed off to tomorrow that no one's going to even notice if you don't do it till t tomorrow. Awesome. I'm going to ask you, Matt, because this is something you're really good at. Um, and I'll give you a brief description of what I do. And then maybe you can, uh, you can let us know what you do. I, I, there are a few people I know that are, that are better at managing tasks and not letting things fall through the cracks um, as Matt. Um, in my world, uh, every day I start off with the brain dump. Usually I do it the night before onto the list. So I know what my list is. And then I rank them. There's a book called Getting Things Done that I read years ago that um, said, once you, once you put everything down in the list, they should be ranked in four categories, A, B, C, and D. A are things that have, um, you know, huge consequences if you don't get them done today. Those all get an A next to them. B are things that have some consequences if you don't get them done today, or they could have consequences if you don't get them done today. And C are that there are no consequences for, the, for not getting this done today. And D is, can anybody guess? It starts with a D. It's delegate. Right. So I start my day and I look at that list and I can rank things. Um, I cheat a little. I don't do an A anymore. I do a star next to the important things. But you would rank them then A, B, C and D. So anything that you could delegate, you put a D next to. And then that's the first thing I do is just delegate all that stuff. I can chip off 25 percent of my list right there. Um, then A's first. You don't move on to a B until your A's are done. So many of us, when we don't rank these lists, end up spending a ton of time and energy because they're maybe a little more enjoyable on all of the C's, right? Like, oh, yep, got to get this done. Got to get this done. Next thing you know, you're almost done with your day. Your A's and B's are still sitting there staring you at the in the face. Now they feel like way bigger than they would have been at the beginning of the day. And it's a problem. So um, we have that. I added one more category into what I do because I tend to have... Um, a bunch of little tasks that can get done quickly. Um, so in the morning when I have my list, I go A, B, C, D, but instead of A, I do a star. Um, and then next to anything that's going to take me three minutes or less, I do a little dash. And that's usually about 80% of my list, 80, 20. And I will give myself permission to clear that first, right? So because to me, there's a there's a value in creating momentum and getting your day going. If I have that list and it's 25 pieces long and I can hit all those dashes in 23 minutes of focused you know, energy there, then, um, then it puts me in a spot where now I can go to the A's and I'm almost done and I'm like an hour or so in as opposed to taking a huge A task first and being like, oh my God, I still got all this stuff to do today. Um, that's how, that's how I've been managing things. And it seemed to be coming together pretty good. That's evolved over the years. But Matt, how do you handle your, your day, your tasks? I mean, definitely one thing that you said is, is essential to me, which is the day, like right before I leave for the day, I already kind of have an idea of what is to come tomorrow because there's, if you are leaving and you don't have everything kind of structured, then you're coming in the next day. And then the first 15 minutes, you're really spending on, okay, what do I need to do? 
Whereas if that's done for you already, you're coming in on a much cleaner slate. So I would say that's, that's number one. Um, I would say number two, I've divided things in a couple different ways. Number one, I think all of us have things that recur like every week. It could be every day. It could be every month. So in my Google calendar, I have that already, like if I have it recurring on Monday, I not only have it recur, but I give myself an email reminder because for me, I'm a very visual person. So I either have to see something written down in front of me in a list form, or I need it to be in my email where I know that if, if it's like, I have to leave most days, it's just, I'm crazy like this, but if I leave with like emails unread or, or you know, especially if it's, if it's before three o'clock for me, I make sure I respond before I leave for the day. If it's after three o'clock, then I can sometimes let that sit for the next day. Um, but, but for me, like if, if I know that I have a recurring task or a monthly task that is, you know, I get an email reminder, then I know that that's going to get done that day, that I'm not leaving until that gets done. So um, that's one thing that I do. The other thing, like I, like I said, I will um, also have like the, the one thing, mouse pad in front of me, I'll, I'll write down what are the, you know, my list for the day, it could be 10 things. And then kind of like you were saying, all time block. So if I know that I can get eight of the tasks done in an hour, if I'm very focused, then I'm gonna make sure that I block at least one hour to get through those things. Because I think if, if, if you don't do that, what'll happen is, you get sidetracked by a lot of different things and then it takes you, you know, three hours to do something that could take, take one hour to, to, to do. So um, I do that. The other thing is, you know, just like the one thing says, I focus on my big rocks within the first hour of the day. So after we do our morning huddle from nine to 10, I do make sure uh, that I get done the things that are, are my big rocks for the day, whether that's lead gen, maybe it's following up with someone. Uh, it, it just depends on the day. And then I love what you just said, A, B, C, D, the D for delegate. Um, what I love is I didn't even realize that I sometimes do that. And that like this morning I met with Christina and you know, we're looking at the October training calendar. So I was like, look, this is something I wanna have you start doing. So I, I met with her first thing to make sure that she had time and her did to, to get all that done. So I, I think you know, if, if you're running a team, it's also having awareness to know you don't wanna dump everything on someone at the end of the day. So I like to meet with, Christina or Allison at the front end of the day. So that way they have the whole day to get something done um, in the delegation process rather than, because I've been in that situation where I get dumped, you know, at four o'clock, it's like, hey, do these 10 things. And it's like, okay, well, I need, I really need to go somewhere. So I think for those who are rainmakers and who run a team, I think it's important to have an awareness of, you know, make sure that you're delegating what needs to be done as soon as you can possibly know that, as opposed to doing it at the end of the day. Awesome. Awesome. Um, anybody else, Jane? You got any thoughts on uh, on you know uh, Maria, where she's like, I just got a a million things to do, and it's it's a balance question. Any yeah. anything pop up over your? Well, I I'm sorry, I popped off. I had a recruit call me back, so I had to pop off on that call. Um, but Maria and I have actually been talking because I called Maria when I caught, was calling through the roster when um, Matt was on vacation, and so I'm checking in with her each week about her rocks to make sure that the big rocks are where she needs to be. So I, I think that she's doing everything she should be doing, and it's going to take you time. You don't change the ship you know hard left it takes a kind of a, a turn and running your own life your father's life and whoever else's life that's a big ship it's not going hard left so it's going to take some time so don't you can't be very hard on yourself over it either you have to be realistic about what it is that you can do and what you can't do and and i did hear a beginning somebody was saying about you know putting the stuff down and crossing it off uh throughout the day i use you know talk about old school you've seen this bill i use one of these notebooks that i have used for the last 15 years and every day look at how good my day is it's all crossed off I've, I've done very good, you know, and it makes you feel good when you're crossing it off. Right. Um, and feeling good is important about getting those things done because then the next time it doesn't feel as bad to do it. So she's going to be okay, Maria. I have faith. You're going to get there. She's going to take us a little time to be organized about it and, and to, to move the ship in the right direction. Awesome. Awesome advice. Um, one, one other thing that Megan had said too, um, that everybody else kind of said indirectly is 
is time, right? How do we protect the time that we set for it? Especially those of us who, you know, are basically in the crosshairs of, of 80 different things flying in, right? At any given time. And uh, I, I worked with a life coach for years. His name is Doug O'Brien. I actually bought him out to our market center when we first, uh, when we first launched, he came to Anthony Franco's. Was anybody on this call there for that? Um, the guy, the, the guy's something else. I mean, he's got a really rough mouth, but he, uh, he, he understands what makes people tick at a level that I've never seen before. Um, and, and some of you guys have heard this story. If it bores you, forget it. I went to this guy in 2012 or 2014 because I couldn't get up early and early to me was, you know, if I got up, if I get up, if you get up at nine o'clock in this business, you're dead, right? Your, your whole day is gone. You're, you're, you know, in quicksand from the minute your eyes open. So um, I wanted to get up earlier, right? At the time, I think it was like seven was early. So I went and I, I, I found him online. I, I go to his office in Manhattan and I sit there and uh, he's like, all right, let's talk through your challenges. You know, what do you want to accomplish here today? And I said, well, I said, I've been trying for about, let's see, I'm 27, about 27 years or whatever it was to get up early. Um, and I'm, I'm just not able to do it. Every night before bed, I psych myself up. I say, I'm going to get up at five o'clock tomorrow. I'm going to hit the gym. I'm going to do all this stuff bright and early in the morning. And then um, you know, I'll be able to take on the day and be in a space to do that. And uh, I said, I just, I, I never can. I enjoy falling asleep again in the morning. I'll hit snooze 75 times and love that roller coaster ride. Um, and it just, it doesn't work. And it's, it's, it's got me held back, right? So he goes, okay. He's like, that's an easy one. We'll fix that before you leave today. Um, what else do you want to work on? Right. And I'm like, what is this guy nuts? And I will tell you, I left there that day. And I think it was, it had to be two years after that, that I didn't wake up at the time that I said, it was the most amazing thing. And the guys, he's got all these mind tricks that just change the world instantly. So I, I, I put him up there as people who changed my life and every conversation I have about that. Um, so anyway, this guy, um, talked, uh, about productivity and his trick and productivity to everybody was to buy a cooking timer, not a cell phone because your cell phone is one of your distracting devices too. One of those old cooking timers that has the little dial on it that you can set it to so many minutes. And he said to not break things down into such big blocks. Like a lot of people do, they say, Hey, set this for an hour. You're only going to do this for an hour in our business. You know, you can have a panic attack at a half hour mark of an hour time block because eight things just went completely wrong that really you need to be involved in. Um, so his, his goal was always 15 minute blocks on his timer. And that was it. He said he would hit it. Everything would go away. He didn't care what happened, right? Even if the, I think he even said something like, even if the building caught on fire, I would have 15 minutes to finish what I'm doing, then get out, right? Um, clearly he's exaggerating a little there, but you get the point. Um, and, and this way it was so simple. Jane's got her book. Megan's got her book. I got my book. This guy who operates at a super high level has a cooking timer from like 1910 that goes ding. And those are the things that are fueling people to, to grow and, and operate at a really high level. So keep that in mind, guys, when you're trying to think of ways to balance all these tasks and stuff. Sometimes it's just about keeping it simple, getting it all out, and then choosing those windows to just completely uh, attack it. Can I add a little something to that? So I recently bought a hydro over, during COVID. A hydro is, is like a Peloton for a rowing machine, but it's you know very fancy with the people yell at you on the screen, the whole thing. And one of the things that they say, you know, you could be eight minutes into a 35 minute workout and they want you to do something for two minutes. And they're like, anybody can do anything for two minutes. You could do anything for two minutes, right? And then you feel bad if you can't finish it for two minutes. So it may not be 15 minutes may not be your timer. It may be six, seven, eight minutes to get started. And then maybe you have to make it longer. You make it longer and longer as you go, because, you know, if you really don't like the task, 15 minutes is a long time. But if you get five minutes done, then maybe the next time you could do seven minutes and just make it a little bit longer each time so you could survive it, right. not fall off the hydro. All right. Nice. Nice. Anybody else want to add to that? Matt, let's, uh, let's pull another challenge out of them, buddy. Yeah, who, uh, who wants to share something? I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. I know some... Uh, 
Seem, I know you've got some business coming up. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that, that you're experiencing. Liz, I know we talked earlier. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Otherwise, I can come up with something for you, Bill. I know Xavier's on too. Um, Liz, are you? I saw you unmute yourself. Did you have something? Um, um, come up as in challenges that we've been having, or? Or I know we talked a little bit about your goal of investment properties. That oh, could be something. Yeah. That was kind of what I was thinking more along the lines of just, you know, I know Bill, Megan. There's a lot of people on this call who who are really some of the best best there is with that. So I'd love for you to maybe just share some of your challenges or just, you know, what your goals are and how we can help you get there. Uh, so my husband and I always talked about um, just buying like investment properties, probably like rentals or, and just, you know, keep it moving on, so on and so on. And um, I'm starting out now as a real estate agent. It's been eight months, eight months. Um, not bad. I'm just, it's been a little bit rough because the kids just started going back to school and I'm still kind of still full time. But since I'm working from home, it's been easier for me to do. Um, but my, now that my husband just passed his real estate exam, it's gonna be even better for me because then it'll be like a bigger, uh, a lot of help. Where he can be, where I can't be, we can be two places at the same time. I guess my question would be like, investment wise, how do you, like how do we see this going? Like, um, is it good to start off? you know, buying rental properties, is it not good? Is it better to do, do like flips for, I guess I'm asking people who, Yeah. I, I see Megan saying no. <laughs> yeah. No. no. <laughs> start with the, start with the rental property if you can. Um, the flips are super sexy, but they are a full-time job. So just be aware of that. A lot of people are like, oh, I'll just flip a house. Like, so you dump your money into it, you buy it, and then you realize it is a full-time job on top of your real estate business. Um, so unless you have a lot of leverage and or you have the budget to pay a contractor to run that entire project, it would recommend trying a multifamily first. That's my experience. We do both. Um, we do flips, but um, Grace, my, my admin's husband, actually runs our flip business so that it is his full-time job, not mine or my husband's. That's my recommendation. I don't know if anyone okay. else has a different experience, but that's my. <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better. A flip is a job. So, so many people look at that as investing, but unless you have somebody to manage that, then, then you just bought yourself another job, right? It's like saying, hey, I want to buy a 7-Eleven because it's got good you know, cash flow but that model is built for the owner to work there. And you're like, God, I didn't really figure this part in the mix and now I gotta be there all those hours. So got it. from a real investment perspective, I, I would say, look, there's a couple different thoughts on this. Multifamilies right now are really high, right? The pricing on them is real high. Your return is really low for per dollar in. And, and that's gonna change when this market corrects. Um, but in, in that case, I would say be, be a little careful to make sure that you put a decent amount down on a rental property just to make sure that you protect yourself for a correction because that market's been going up for quite a while. Um, you know, if you found a great deal, um, people will throw money at you to buy the investment property. So don't ever shy away by saying, I don't have the money for this. Um, if, I would go as far as saying, if you found an amazing investment opportunity in a real estate end and you put it out on our um, prosperity agent community, that you would have people there to help you make that a reality. Um, okay. Now, what I would say though, is it's, it's best. So, so you have a couple of different, you have a couple of different uh, philosophies on this. If you uh, listen to, um, now I'm drawing a blank with, with this guy's name. He's an investment advisor um, and he's super conservative. Like he says, you never buy an investment property unless you can buy it cash, right? Then your cash flow is great, but you know, now you've, it's taken you a ton of money and you're not able to leverage the low interest rates to get there. Um, David Ramsey, that's his name. Um, he, he's got a very, very um, 
cautious philosophy on investing because at one point in time, he owned millions and millions of dollars worth of real estate that he invested in. He did it right. And the market took a turn and the bank that he had all his loans with called his notes due because they didn't feel like he would possibly be able to um, handle that down the road. He defaulted on nothing and they ended up taking all his property. So he has gone completely in the other direction. Um, my level of comfort is somewhere in the middle of those two. I, I'm not crazy about 0% down financing and stuff. It's great leverage. That gets a lot of people started. Um, but if you catch the market at the wrong time, it can also sink your ship. Um, if you're, you're under leveraging by paying everything cash, you know, in today's market with interest rates so low, that might not make so much sense. So for me, the big difference came when I had a plan. And I would say that... Um, that is probably the most important part. If I could give any advice to somebody in your shoes, I made a ton of money when I was younger and in my early twenties, um, I made a ton of money. I wasn't into drugs. I didn't do anything crazy. And I blew everything I made because I didn't have a plan for it, right? If you don't have a plan for it, like summer would be over. I'd be like, where did all that money go, right? You just. <laughs> A little goes out here, you know, crazy dinner here. You buy the whole bar around here. Next thing you know, you, you got to go back and sell 20 more houses. Um, you know, I, I, that's what got me into reading a lot about finance and books and listening a lot uh, and, and trying to understand the personal budget in a, in a business like ours where, where it's a, 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 an up and down uh, as far as our income goes. It's not steady. So I would go as far, uh, and I'm going to ask Megan to tell us maybe a little bit about her personal um, piece too, but I put a plan together that was really simple and it said, hey, it might be small at the beginning, but I'm going to put 10% of every paycheck into a separate account and that account is going to be just for investment properties. It's only going to be for real estate um, and that's what I ended up doing, right? Um, then I have a broader investment account that allowed me to play in like stocks and stuff, which... Um, you know, I look back, I bought Tesla at like $150 a share and that was pre-split. It went up to like $1,600 a share. Um, and I did that out of an investment account that I had money allocated for that and for that alone. That money is there to invest with. I'm never allowed to spend it. I'm never allowed to, to take it and roll dice and gamble with it. I can only put it in safe avenues of investment, whether it be real estate or the stock market. And over the years, that started to compound. And then as as you buy properties and money comes in, that goes back into the pot, right? And then that continues to grow and it becomes like a uh, uh, snowball uh, effect there too. But it all starts with being very purposeful to the point where you say, how much, literally to the dollar or the percentage, what from every check are you gonna put aside? And if your answer is, I don't have the money to put aside yet, then start with something stupid, like a dollar. I will put a dot, I will open that account tomorrow. You and your husband get on the same page and say, I'm gonna put a dollar from every closing or I'm gonna put a dollar a week into there, transfer it in, be purposeful, focus on that. That becomes a priority in your world and fueling that account. And before you know it, you're gonna have a ton of money sitting in there and you're gonna be in a position to use that on a down payment for um, a property. Um, Megan, uh, any, any thoughts on, on that from your perspective? Are, are you guys purposeful? Like, do you, you don't just go into your savings account or your operation fund to feed your family and say, hey, I'm gonna take this and buy an investment property, do you? No, <laughs> no. Um, we, put a, we put aside 10% uh, of every uh, commission check to investment property um, or investments in general. Um, and the money that we make on our current investment properties stay in those accounts. So it just accrues. Um, my goal is to be six months ahead on all of our properties. Um, but with that being said, if we come across a, a good opportunity, I will remove some of that money to invest it from those accounts. Um, so that's like, once you have a few, that's kind of how I run it. Um, but the biggest thing with investment property is you can't have money burning a hole in your pocket. So if you have that down payment amount, so say you, you have your 20% to go buy, you know, a $350,000 two family, don't go out and just buy one. Like you need to wait for the opportunity because the opportunity comes when you're not looking for it. It doesn't come to you when you're like, I got this money, I got to go buy it. Uh, you like run. That's when you end up making a bad decision. Um, like our goal for this year, we, we always set a goal. So my goal for this year was to buy three investment properties and to flip a minimum of three. 
Um, we obviously, once COVID hit, that totally shifted. Um, at the time, we were under contract on three flip properties, um, and we had just sold a flip property, and we were under contract on three investment properties. We dropped one investment property and dropped all three flip properties when COVID hit because when COVID hit, they were no longer a good investment because we just didn't quite know what the market was going to look like. Um, but with that being said, we've actually resurrected. We still have two investment properties. We just closed on one, which was a single family that we are converting into a two family because it's in two family zoning. That's what Bill was saying. Like, it's really difficult right now to find really good opportunities. We were able to buy a single family in Bootin for basically 300 that we're converting into a two family, which we can turn around and sell tomorrow for 450. So, or we're just keeping it and we're just going to rent it out. But we weren't looking for a property at that point. We knew like in the back of our head, we'd put in the universe, we're trying to find three investment properties, but we just run our search every single week. We spend two hours a week, basically um, looking for properties. You have to be intentional about that time, look for the property, but if nothing works, then nothing works. You can't say I'm going to buy a property by X date because if, it, if the opportunity is not there, then the opportunity is not there. It will come. Um, you just, you can't like, I, that's the one thing that we see investors do all the time is like, I have to have a property by the end of the month. When you do something like that, you run into a problem where you, you overpay for something, which right now the market is super hot. So you have to get a little more creative. Um, so you got to be a little more creative when you're trying to buy the properties, but I just would recommend if you have that money, don't just like run out and try and spend it. Um, see how far you can stretch it. We're actually syndicating a deal right now with a client. So we found this property. We said we really like it. And we were looking with another investor and we were like, Hey, you want to go in on it together? He was like, yeah, I got the down payment. We're like sold. So we are buying it. No money out of pocket. They're putting the money in and we're going to end up with a mixed use property that is really a great, great investment. But again, we weren't like specifically looking for that property. It kind of fell in our lap. We found it. We made it happen. So that's what, what Bill was saying. If you find a good opportunity, put it on that page, like we will invest. <laughs> if it's a good opportunity, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. Okay. So, nuggets. <laughs> Liz, this um, was a great insight. Real quick, do you uh, are you okay with me asking a couple uh, personal questions? I won't get too in detail. I promise. Okay. Do you currently own a, a, a home, like as your primary? No. Okay. Um, so the, there are. I'll tell you what my plan was, and then I got married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I. Um, not really. So my plan was to um, leverage FHA. Um, my, my original plan at the time was I wanted my first uh, purchase. I had bought some investment properties prior to. I had owned flip properties before I ever bought a house to live in. Um, but I wanted to buy an FHA for family with three and a half percent down. At the time, uh, PMI wasn't even for the life of the loan. So in a, in a matter of no time, you could shed your PMI on that. So three and a half percent down, you can get into a four family home and, and use the income as additional income to qualify. Very, very rare in the lending world, right? Um, so, you know, my, my plan was to buy a, a three or four family, owner occupy it for a short period of time, and then move on purchase maybe a condo that I knew would have a strong rental rate, 5% down conventional, stay there for, you know, a short time, year or two, and then purchase my, excuse me, my primary with 5% down. If I add all those percentages up, that gives me 13 and a half percent down. I would now own my primary, a condo that would have been positive cash flow, and then a three or four unit building, all bringing in money, especially when we fast forward and see what the market's done. You know, this is my, my mid twenties that I was having this conversation with myself. Wow, it ended up being a little bit later actually. Um, the flip way to do this is you buy your primary first with a 5% down conventional or 20% down, whatever you wanna do. You buy that first. Now you need 20% minimum in order to buy your investment property if you want to own it solely, right? So it, it, it forces you to have a significant amount more capital in order to get that started. So anybody who does not have a, a home that would, that would qualify as a primary to a bank, 
I highly encourage you to purchase a multifamily, take advantage of the interest rates where they are right now, and you can get in at a little lower rate and you can qualify by using the rental income of the other units to up what you would normally qualify for. Um, and, and look, I wouldn't take every last penny and do this. I would keep some money on the sidelines. You always want to have a cushion, but man, that right now is, is the most amazing opportunity for someone to jump into the investment game by making it their first purchase that it will launch you 10 a decade ahead of people who take the alternative approach, in my opinion. We did that. We did that. Uh, we bought a two family in Booton, moved in, and we moved out and gave ourselves a $2,700 raise because we put renters in there and we used that as leverage to buy our now house that we're renovating. It's wow. the best way to go. I call those livable two families because there's two family investments and then there's livable ones, which <laughs> you know what those look like. They're, they probably are a Cape Cod. They've got a three bed, two bath on the first floor and a two bed, two bath or two bed, one bath on the second floor. Those are livable. Those are awesome because you can either take the two bed or the three bed. Whereas if you have a two bed and a one bed, it's like you kind of feel bad living in the two bed when you know you could get more rent for it. So you move to the one bed and it's not totally livable because you really need a little more space. That's so I call those livable two families. If you really have like a three bed and a two bed, cause that's, those are really good investment. And then if you move out, you're giving yourself a great raise and it counts as income and then right. you finance it down the road, pull cash out, use the equity leverage, all those fun things. I, and guys, if you're sitting there and you're like, Oh, I already have a primary that doesn't, that doesn't help be creative. Like one thing that, you know, investors do is think creatively around a situation. It's never just a box. You gotta, you gotta be flexible. Um, you know, Megan just gave a couple of um, conversations about creativity, a syndication deal that they're putting together. The, the fact that they bought a one family that they're going to convert to a two and have a, a huge margin gain there. Um, let's say you have, let's say you have kids, right? And you have your primary house. There's no way a bank's going to believe that you're buying a property to live in. That's a multi, but maybe, maybe one of your kids is going away to college in a year or two. Um, by the way, FHA, I'm pretty sure you could still do non-occupant co-borrower. So you could actually purchase a property for three and a half percent down an investment property at the school your kid's going to. In your, with your, your kid could be the buyer. You could be a non-occupant co-borrower. Use the rental income of the additional units there. Have him live there for free. And not only would that be a moneymaker potentially, but that would put you in the position to have an incredible, um, you know, start for your college kid. We have a couple of college kids in the market center that are agents, some of which just bought their first investment property, same way. Um, so really quick on that bill, you cannot with FHA currently have a non-occupying co-borrower on a two family. Okay. And on a three plus plus and not on a two family. So um, I just had that like confirmed again because we ran into that um, a, two years ago with the client and with us. Um, but you can on a three plus unit. So look for that three plus unit. If you're trying to go FHA with a non-occupying co-borrower, cool. but FHA hasn't changed the rules yet on that two family. If they do, can someone please let me know? Because that will change <laughs> everyone's world when it comes to non-occupying co-borrowers. <laughs> yeah. There's enough competition in the two family world. I think we can keep without that. Right. That would just, that would just put it off the chart. It's crazy. <laughs> But look for the three family. That's that's where your money is going to be. Uh, this is really good. Any uh, anybody else out there want to share any insight on any, uh, or anything that they've done before we sign off here? We got two minutes. All right, Megan. Thank you as always. Um, you know everybody else. Jane uh, who popped in. Um, Maria, Liz. Anybody else who uh, who I didn't mention who who was you know on here? Please uh, forgive me for not giving you a personal uh, thank you, but uh, thank everybody for coming on and plugging in. And this is this is what I love when they're all over. They're all different kinds of ideas, and um, you know some of some of the things that I hear and learn in any one of these, I uh, I could never put a dollar sign on either. So. Um, thank you all again. Everybody have a great day tomorrow morning, mega camp. I'm hoping to see everybody that's on here on there and, uh, just keep killing it guys.
Thank you. Take care.